All right, I'm here in Toronto, Ontario with Mecca Mako. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. How's the album release party been going so far? It's going pretty well. I'm, I've am i seen a lot of familiar faces and a lot of people that I've never seen before, but that's uh, super encouraging. So to start off, um, before Mecha Mako and before you were in Dead Astronauts um, or any of your current side projects, how did you initially become involved with playing music? Well, it was something that I sort of started pretty early on. My uncle lent me his keyboard in the mid to late 90s and I was only supposed to borrow it for a weekend and I just never gave it back and I still record music on it to this day. So um, I guess it was always something that I would just do in my spare time if my parents were watching a movie and I didn't want to sit with them and watch it. But yeah, spent lots of nights cooped up in my room like writing dumb songs and I guess I still do that today so it's like a compulsive behavior at this point. It's clear to see that uh, a lot of Japanese culture has played an important part in developing your taste and style. You said that you became a huge fan of Sailor Moon at an early age. Uh, The Mako in your stage name is a job title reserved for geishas in training and I think there was even a photo of you online from a trip to Japan when you were dressed as a geisha at 13. Uh, What about that culture has struck such a chord with you? Well, I mean, I was always such a huge fan of the Japanese street fashion that was coming out of Japan in the late 90s, and that sort of got me interested in the culture. Um, But yeah, like, the music is beautiful, the entertainment culture is just, there's so many different facets to it. There's the really zany, wacky, uh, sort of extreme side that you sometimes see on TV and then they have this intensely rich beautiful culture like cultural history with um, like the culture of like geisha and geiko and um, yeah there's they have a real dichotomy to um, like a rich sense of, of history but then they're also really good at not taking themselves too seriously and being kind of like zany and out there so um I don't know. There's a lot that I appreciate from it, and uh, um, I don't know what else I can say. Have you visited Japan a a lot of times, or was it just that one time from that photo? Um, I've only visited Japan once when I was 13, and uh, that was because my childhood best friend had moved away there, and a little bit before I started becoming obsessed with Japan and really wanted to go, and it sort of gave me the perfect opportunity to go and meet her and hang out uh, for two weeks there. But it's really weird being 13 in Japan because it's not like you can go and see any live shows because you're 13 and can't get into any venues. But at the same time, um, there's still a lot more lax about certain things. and. Uh, I was still able to get into karaoke bars, which was really fun, so I spent a lot of time doing that, but I would love to go back. I feel like I knew zero Japanese when I was there, and now I know, like, a touch more, but it's all, like, shameful things that I picked up from anime, so it's not true. (laughs) Shameful things? Yeah, just, like, shameful, impractical things that you learn from watching anime that make you seem like a giant weeaboo, so, you know. You also have a passion for photography, and you even have a side business as a graphic designer and retouching photos for people. How long have you been in this field, and what initially sparked your interest in it? I went to school for photography because I originally thought I was always going to go into fashion design, but then wanted to pick up something I I was interested in but didn't really know a lot of the technical skills behind it. So I went to school for photography and kind of fell in love with it, and... um, straight out of school started assisting a retoucher and found that instead of the usual route of doing photo assisting to get into the photo world and sort of just make some money and get experience I uh, I really enjoy doing the retouching so that's my current like side job but um, yeah I still shoot a lot and more so these days I'm finding ways to sort of blend my love of photography with my love for music and sort of helping other local artists if they need photos so it's difficult it's like 
I've come to a few points in my life where I feel like I've had to choose between doing one or the other if it's going to be photos or music, but it's really difficult. It's as much as I have the urge to make music late at night, it's I have the urge to pick up a camera and work on a project. So, yeah. Did you work with Vice at one point? I heard that you hosted like a Sailor Moon event or something <laughs> along those lines and you photographed it as well. Yeah, um, so I was, I did a lot of work with Vice last year. They're, they would either have, um, I'd either pitch stories to them because um, I had a lot of work that sort of revolved around um, cosplay and conventions. And so for a while I was doing a few daily vice segments where I was actually hosting and on camera but uh, at the same time I would go and shoot portraits for um, this really talented writer Alison Tierney who would do um, these really great stories and I'd have the chance to come and do some portraits with her so yeah it was nice. I heard that you're also quite the seamstress as well. When did you pick that up and what was the last thing that you remember making? So, I, yeah, that, that is one hobby that, like, I will pick up and run with and then abandon for months at a time. But the, I think the last thing I made was a, uh, it was a Halloween costume. I was Squeaky From, who is uh, part of the, the Manson family. And she actually attempted to assassinate the president in that same, like, red long gown. So I had, like, this big red hippie cloak with a gun strapped to my leg underneath. So that was my last thing. What was the reception to the outfit? Did anyone recognize you? Um, some... Uh, no. Nobody, no, no. Nobody in real life recognized me. Everybody was like, oh, that's... Cool, but I was an idiot and brought it to work. And then um, my my boss came up to me and was like, "You should probably like lose the fake gun because I think that I think that's not going to go well with HR." I'm like, mm, "Okay, all right." So most people were originally introduced to you through your work with uh, Jared Nickerson on Dead Astronauts. How did the two of you come into contact and begin making music together? Well, you know, it's like a classic internet story where um, I was working with a producer who was doing a lot of house music, and he, I was doing vocals for him, and uh, this producer actually knew Jared through his illustration work, and so he'd been sort of in contact with him, saying that he was thinking about starting up this Dead Astronauts project, but had the song finished, but really just wanted, like, a touch of female vocals on it. So uh, I got in con he got in contact with me and I delivered him vocals like the next night and then he invited me to be a part of the band and uh, yeah it ended up being quite the endeavor after that it was uh, a lot more in depth than I thought. All right so while you were in Dead Astronauts Jared was living in Seattle and you were here in Toronto and the two of you would kind of swap ideas back and forth through Dropbox or have beings through Skype, was there any noticeable hurdles to overcome and with writing songs while being so far away, or was it relatively smooth? Um, I think the only real hurdle was, um, I guess, maybe timing of things because of the the time difference between the two of us. But in terms, like. I think we worked out a system that was pretty good because I only had, there's only a few seconds of delay between when I would broadcast out audio that he could listen to and then when he could give me his feedback. So I guess if I was like trying to choose a certain snare sample to use and he was like, oh yeah, stop there, that's great. There would be like four that I had technically played in between. So that was the only thing that kind of got rocky. And um, in terms of actual jam sessions, it would be, I would work on something and then he'd be like, oh, I have a vocal idea. And so I'd have to export the instrumental and send it over. And then he would record something back and then send it to me. But even that entire process would just be like five or 10 minutes. So it's, uh, it would be nice to be able to just have like a quintessential jam session where you're 
you're able to just sort of like improvise on the spot but um, I don't know I think that luckily our technology is fast enough that it wasn't really a huge problem and then if you did a great first take then I didn't need another one I could just use that. Early on into Dead Astronauts you took on the role of lead producer starting with the track In Disguise were there any new duties that took some getting used to with that title? Oh, for sure. It was uh, the first time that, I mean, up until that point, all of the work that I had done, I was used to producers coming up to me and telling me that they loved my voice and they just wanted to produce for me. And uh, I sort of had it in my head that I wasn't a very good producer, that I needed to do a lot of work to kind of get where I needed to be. So um, I think at that point I was very used to working on a song for one or two days and then being like this is good it's ready and then putting it out into the world and so working with Jared I learned to take things a lot slower and pay a lot more attention to each facet of the song so I had to get a little bit more creative with uh, the drums for instance so it's not just like a four floor beat with a couple loops here and there and while some of the beat patterns are really simple it's just something that I kind of listen for more than I used to. No, it, it just forced me to really take it seriously and work through a lot of different drafts and um, develop a style that was true to myself, but also that would work for both Jared and my tastes. What was the first time you were able to meet in person? Um, oh, I can't remember the year exactly, but we met, oh my God. I'm upset that I can't remember the year off the top of my head, but um, yeah, I flew down to Seattle and I stayed with Jared and his wife in their lovely house and uh, we ended up going to Portland for most of the trip because we were meeting with our label at the time, Nueva Forma, and a couple other artists that were on that label and it was a really fun few days there. We did photos together which we'd never done before we were just like photoshopped ourselves in together before that point um but it was it was really nice it was uh it's so weird working and seeing somebody on skype like every week for a few years and then finally meeting them and you're like i i saw him and i was like blown away because he was like the same height as me and I just always assume, and he was like, dude, you're so tall. I'm like, no offense, but like, you're short. Like, I didn't, like, I just expected you to be like this big guy, but he's like, I don't know. Anyway, it was fun. It was a really uh, cool, cool weekend. I got to see lots of uh, little neat places in Seattle and Portland, and it was good. It was sunny the whole time, which is very rare. One of your earliest releases, the EP 2.0, was a pretty big collaborative effort with Perturbator, who offered to do a remix for each song you had written for it. Uh, how did that relationship come to fruition? Uh, pure luck, basically. Um, we had this EP figured out, and we were trying to get a bunch of different artists to do remixes for it. And Perturbator, surprisingly enough, was the only guy who would get back to us super quick and he like was super stoked on the album and he had a remix for us right away and everybody else was like really flaky and wasn't really sure um but I was really excited that he was doing this remix and Jared was like let's just ask him to do the whole album like he he's really good and uh he's like really keen on it so we asked him and he was down for it and had some really unique uh, interpretations of the songs on there so we totally lucked out um, that he was just willing and able to do it and uh, yeah I wonder I feel like th that sort of same thing might not be I think we had the the luck of timing at that point before he started to do lots of tours and stuff like that so um, yeah, I don't know if we'd have that same luck now if we were to contact him and be like, remix this, but I'm happy, I'm happy it worked out. Uh, while you were still in Dead Astronauts, you began two side projects, first Manfred and later Bazooey. Uh, how did these two ventures come about, and may I ask where the names originate from? Okay, 
So, oh Jesus Christ. Bazooey is basically um, my username that I would use. It is like a take on a childhood nickname that my family gave for me, which is the Booch, because there was... The booch. Yeah, the Booch. There was an Olympic... When I was a baby, I had like really fat, stocky legs, and uh, there was this one Olympic... I don't know what they did. There's this person named Butrus Butruskaya, and so they named me, they like nicknamed me that, and then that turned into, during like a real spike in like Snoop Dogg's prominence, they started calling me Bizooch, and then it just turned into Bazooey. It's like a really embarrassing. It's a very like, complicated name. origin. It's so story. complicated. But that was my first, 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 first music project ever. So all of my pretty rough stuff is on there. And then I tried to be a little bit more focused with it and start Manfred, which was supposed to be very more, like much more minimal with the vocals. And if it's in there, it's more for like atmospheric backing. And then if it's not, I'll just like say it's a collaboration. It's supposed to be more of like a genderless project that isn't so rooted in like a female face to it. It's it's more about the instruments than anything else. So it was just uh, a way to sort of, sort of stay involved with um, making music that that falls outside of the like synth pop, synth wave genre, and um, kind of get more into the sort of housey side of things that I like, or really just like a place where I can experiment some more with different sounds. I, I do have to ask though, you're the only artist I've met who's collaborated with themselves <laughs> because there's a song on Bazooey's page but it's by Manfred and featuring Bazooey called yes. Blur. Can you please explain that? Okay, so I didn't feel like it was a track that was enough of one or the other to like dedicate. I produced the song and I thought it was a very like Manfred production because it was sort of dark and weird but then... I wanted, to, yeah, and that's basically it. I just wanted to be like, oh, Bazooey, the, the vocal stylings of Bazooey with the production values of Manfred. Huh. Probably won't do that again, though. So you decided to leave Dead Astronauts after the release of the last album, uh, Arms of Night, back in 2016. What was it that made you decide there was time to change things up? I had sort of just... Graduated school, moved out, was trying to figure out my career here in, in the city with photography. And it was getting to be, um, I was just getting to be too busy even for the weekly music meetings. It was one of the things where I think that we both kind of felt that we were moving in sort of different creative directions. And there was always a lot of like push and pull between us, which granted makes really good um, really good songs but it got to the point where I felt like I just wanted to be able to take a step back and not have uh, not really have to have anybody either depending on me if I can't make it to something um, and I just wanted to try to venture off on my own and work on a bunch of songs that I'd sort of been working on in the shadows that I wanted to use for a solo project. So some of the songs on this album are maybe like four years old that I only just sort of wrapped up and packaged nicely for the album. Um, and yeah, I mean, for every song on the album, there's probably like three more that I've started that I need to wrap up. So I just needed a, a way to get all of this out. <laughs> Looking back, do you have a favorite record from your time with Jared? Yeah, I think Constellations is my favorite. It was the most labor-intensive project because that was when we really dedicated ourselves to the 80s sound. I think at the very beginning, we were Jared's vision for the band was to do like cosmic dark disco, which was, I guess, very like LCD sound system. And at the time, I was really listening to synthwave, and I was like, I can't do it. I need to do this. This is so good. Um, so he was on board, but that was a. Uh, it was a record that I think was made purely just from like the pleasure of making music and discovering the sound and uh, a lot of the songs are 
pretty pretty simple structurally, but um, yeah, that was all made in GarageBand with like a bunch of free VSTs and sometimes keeping it simple is uh, you get good results. Before deciding to start a new project with Mecha Mako, was there ever a point where you debated on pursuing Bazooey or Manfred more aggressively and turning that into your main project? Um, I think there was a point when I was interested in Manfred. When I was trying to kind of break out of just being an internet musician, I was sort of debating between doing, um, doing like a music video for Manfred or for Mecha Maiko, and uh, I couldn't really decide, but yeah, no, it, it was really difficult. I, uh, I guess I just had more songs that suited the Mecha Maiko thing that were more poppy and vocally driven, and so... Yeah, I think that's that's basically it. Like I have I have enough to put out a Manfred EP, but I have enough of this other stuff to do like a few albums with, so So with Map It Soft coming out in a few days, uh, how long have you been working on it and uh, where does the name of it come from? I guess all in all it's been something that I've been working on over the past few years, so um, the song Electric Heat was probably started maybe three or four years ago. And now is, that's probably the oldest, that's like the very first song that I ever wrote for uh, this project. And then Mad But Soft comes from a lyric in that same song. Um, and it, it was supposed to sort of exemplify, like mad as in angry, but also crazy, but soft. So it's about sort of like this like angsty female sort of energy sort of the dichotomy between being sweet but also being angry and aggressive and uh, which I think Mecha Maiko sort of uh, translates as well Mecha anime which is like robot anime which is all like very masculine powerful metal beasts that are destroying the city streets and then you have Maiko which are sort of trained to be these extremely talented graceful like beautiful beings so I wanted to sort of fuse those two energies it's about singing very sweetly about some very uh, very angsty feelings was there anything in particular in terms of like other music or movies or anything along those lines that you drew a lot of inspiration from when writing the album? Oh my gosh. It's like anything that I absorbed during that time probably did play a huge role. So there's a couple like very small synth things that I really like from this uh, Russian artist Miyuki. And she does a lot of field recordings in Japan um, and makes these very amazing, like, cyberpunk sci-fi, like, heavily experimental electronic tracks that just use sound in such an incredible way, so you should definitely check her out. Um, but she also has, like, on every album she'll have, like, this really great dancey sort of track that kind of diverts. And then, of course, as always, trying to pull back from sort of authentic 80s sounds, like, I'm a big New Order fan. But in terms of particular things, I don't know, like maybe some Eurythmics is in there. There's just, there's kind of too much to name, but I can't really attribute anything specific. I think every song on this album was sort of birthed from me just feeling a need to make it. And it's a, I guess it's sort of naive in that way, but hopefully it's nice. Lastly, uh, do you intend on going on tour at all? after the whole release extravaganza is taken care of? Mm, in terms of tour, I do have a couple shows in the future booked, kind of. Um, I've never actually performed live before. Tonight is like my closest thing I've ever done to it, even though it's just me playing a DJ mix. <laughs> um, but if I am going to tour in the future, I really want to try to do things that incorporate that original keyboard that I sort of learned on so I can play with it and use some of those sort of dated, like they were super dated sounds when I was using that, using it when I was a kid, but I still love them a lot. So I'm going to try to find a way to make it work. 
All right, uh, that's about it. Any last words? Ooh. How much? Support Tana Jean Phoenix. Support Fempop. They're both on my album, and they're super fantastic ladies. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.